we're back. Episode 117 of History for Weirdos. Let's go, weirdos. You know it's always a good time to be back. Yes, and it's always a good time for me when it's your week to tell me a story. Yes, I know. I feel like we say this every single week, but it's true. Like, it's 100% true. There's pressure when it's your week. It's a different vibe. <laughs> like, when it's your story week, I should say. Yes, because you're... You're really researching your story, right? Yeah. And, that's the, and you want to make sure it sounds really good. Yeah. Um, you're kind of like leading the show exactly, for the week. Exactly. Exactly. And it gives, it's an extra pressure. But when you're not leading the show, it's incredible because you just get amazing story time. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> and this cannot be like overstated, I feel like. And before we jump into the amazing story time, uh, we did want to share just a couple of like fun updates with the weirdos, like personal stuff. One is a TV show recommendation. Oh, yes. On Netflix called Detective Forced. Detective Forced. It's a Polish show. It's a Polish show. And this isn't a history recommendation. But since this month, our themes for the episodes were murder. This is a murder mystery, serial killery, true crime show from Poland. Right. And it's very dark. Yeah. Uh, but it is, I think it's pretty well done. It doesn't have the greatest reviews on IMDb we saw, mm -hmm. but that surprised me because I was, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, is it the greatest show ever made? No, but like, do I really like it? And I want a second season. Absolutely. Yes. So if you are into like true crime detective shows and you're into some darker content, I would look up like content warnings. <laughs> uh, we definitely recommend it. Absolutely. And then last but not least not history or murder related but we went to our first monster truck show this weekend and we loved it we did okay <laughs> i know it sounds so bad and it's so and to like our non-american listeners are you guys are probably sitting there being like wow that is the most stereotypical american shit ever and i agree but honestly don't knock it until you try it it was really fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It is very loud. So if you ever go to a monster truck show, I do recommend bringing like earplugs or noise canceling headphones. But I was surprised at how um, family friendly the environment was. I was too. That honestly kind of surprised me. Um, I thought we're not it was going to be scarier. Yeah. By the way, we're not getting paid. Oh we're my just... God. Could you imagine if we got sponsored by like the monster truck people? I don't even know what they're called. Monster Jam. Monster Jam. That's right. <laughs> We're okay. not paid by Monster Jam, we promise. I know. They're just getting free publicity. Yeah. But it was really cool. It was really fun. And it's it was kind of weird, like, in the best way. So we thought you all would like to know that we do recommend the Monster Truck Show. It was it was an experience. Yeah. I'll say that. Um, it was a lot of fun, though. Okay. And now, my love, tell us. What do you have in store for us this week? It better be murder related because you set that theme. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> and yes, it is murder related. And we're actually going to be covering a murder that has national implications. National implications. Okay. Oh, yes. So when you hear of presidential assassinations, who do you think of? Abraham Lincoln first and then JFK. Yes. Agreed. Everyone always thinks of one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. Every single time. But we're going to be talking about the assassination of President William McKinley this week. Oh my gosh, that's right. <laughs> McKinley was assassinated as well. Yes, there have been four presidents that have been assassinated. And then there's James, I think James Garfield. And his assassination, I feel like, is even less well-known than McKinley's. But McKinley's is, oh, I hate to say it, it's a little bit more interesting. There's more to the story? There's more to the story, right. McKinley's assassination is how Theodore Roosevelt became president, right? Yes, and we'll get into that, actually, at okay. the end of this episode. Oh, so interesting. I'm, I'm excited oh, yeah. to learn more. Oh, yes. So, he was assassinated. He, as in President William McKinley, was assassinated on September 6th, 1901 in Buffalo, New York. Oh, wow. So, right where your dad went to college, actually. I know. Also in 1901. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to love that. <laughs> That's for you, dad, if you're listening. Yeah. So he was at this time, the third U S president to be assassinated following Lincoln and James A. Garfield. Wow. Um, but before we get into the actual event of the assassination, let's take a look at like how the heck this even happened. Like mm -hmm. what led up to this? Mm -hmm. So it's funny. I re clearly remember learning kind of late 19th century history um, in I think elementary school and in high school, 
and just being bored to tears by it. Really? It was not my time. I think it's such an interesting time. Yeah, I, I do like it now, yeah. but this was like 16 year old Andrew. Mm-hmm. He's a little bit, a little bit less mature. He had less of a refined palate. Maybe I, I could, <laughs> I, he, that's a good argument. <laughs> I didn't even, I was like stuttering. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. And it also, I think it is ironic because you, that's might be your favorite period of history. I don't even think about it consciously. I just always tend to gravitate towards it. It's so strange. That's why I say it's your favorite. Yeah. Because that is, that's kind of how I gravitate towards the late Roman Republic. Yeah. You always gravitate towards this Victorian era Mm -hmm. or the Gilded Age, you know, whatever you want to call this time period. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, a little bit older, a little bit wiser. So I appreciate this time a little bit more now. But let's get into life or what life was like in the late 19th century or, you know, as it's sometimes known, the gold, the Gilded Age, not the Golden Age, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age. Amazing TV show. That is a really good show. Speaking really, of history wrecks. Really good show. It's like almost nothing happens, but it's so dramatic. Yeah, it's very Downton Abbey. Yeah, it's the writers of Downton Abbey. Mm-hmm. I love the dresses. Of course you do. The dresses are so cool. <laughs> I love like what interests us in like a tv show or especially a historical Mm. tv show i'm usually really interested in like national like implications or like the plots and stuff like that and you really like the set like the the set and the costume yes exactly i love it but i I do i mean but i also i feel like we both appreciate the other one as well like i do i love the set just not as much as the plot and you and vice versa i feel like for you yeah exactly so back to our narrative here, the Civil War, it ended in 1865, right? Mm-hmm. You guys should know that. Unless you're not American. If you're American, you really should know that. And then the, <laughs> and the country started to go reconstruction. That also was so judgmental, and I'm sorry. <laughs> like That just came out of me. Andrew's already <laughs> shaming really just... us for not knowing the exact year <laughs> yeah. that the Civil War ended. We didn't even say anything, you guys. <laughs> no, I was just like... <laughs> So one of you <laughs> doesn't, one know, of you doesn't that. know this and it's pissing me off. Okay. Re- repeat the year since it's important. It's 1865. 1865. That's the year that uh, the Civil War ended and that Lincoln was ironically assassinated. Now we know. So uh, this was also a time like immediately after like the recon was what it's called the reconstruction era from about 1865 mm-hmm. to like 1877, 1878, something somewhere along those lines. Not a happy time in the U.S. It's not. Um, it's. It was partially success in that, like, it did bring the union back together, right? Mm-hmm. Especially after a very disastrous civil war. Um, but again, like you said, it wasn't all a success. Uh, this, this, there was a so-called redeemer faction, quote unquote, in the United States. Um, they were largely a very militant portion of the de- Democratic Party mm. that wanted t- to form like a sense of white supremacy in the South. Oh my gosh! So How they were they were peaches. Yeah, they were not they were not nice people. Um, they had different paramilitary groups to even help them do this. Oh wow! Yeah, you had the Red Shirts, the White League, and most infamously the Klu- the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, I didn't realize that was connected to this. Yes. Oh, disgusting. Yeah, they used violence, intimidation to enforce these ideals, right? And they were essentially domestic terrorists. mm Hmm. Um, I mean, there was even like acts of Congress. Like there is the Ku Klux Klan Act, which like limited, it even like suspended habeas corpus for people who participated in that group. Yeah. Like they were not, not good. Yeah. And they, I know that a lot of um, KKK members were also in like high positions of power. Yes. Typically like very powerful in their like communities or local governments at least. Right. Especially um, at low, at local and state level governments yeah they were really well entrenched and mm-hmm. that's why you needed like literal acts of congress to kind of target that and weed them out right mm-hmm. and there's i mean there's even corruption which we'll get into in a second but if you want a little bit more on like that kind of uh the racial tension and the the history of like those terrible groups we actually do cover them in episode 58 the wilmington massacre Mm -hmm. if you're learning you know wanting to learn more about that yeah it's really interesting but it's tough i'm not gonna lie you did that episode and you did a great job thank you yeah Mm -hmm. that was arguably the toughest episode i think i ever did yeah it was just it was just terrible but anyway you should go listen but go listen (laughs) i mean it is interesting it's Mm -hmm. just important to learn right so 
here's the thing though, like racial tension, not going great in the country at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was just one facet. It was very complex. And there is emerged this huge economic disparity between Southern states and the Northern states with wealth being more concentrated, you know, in the union or the former union states, the Northern states. I'm sure that's going to build resentment. Yes. Uh, this would be attempted to be resolved by like investing in railways, um, especially in the Southern states to connect that part of the country mm -hmm. to the North. Cause remember guys, like there aren't interstate highways at this point in time. Yeah. That's not for another, you know, hundred years, literally. So again, this po like partially helped, but there was so much corruption at state level governments that like a lot of the time, maybe, you know, they cut corners at, at the best case or uh, the worst case is like these things aren't even brought to fruition and the money just goes to state officials and their friends. <sighs> like, I mean, literally just the definition of corruption. Yeah. It was terrible. So you have a national political environment that is, you know, at its underlying core uh, tension. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is the environment that Leon Chol Cholgosh was born into in 1873. Okay. Leon, if you hadn't guessed it, would play the part of the assassin to President William McKinley 28 years later. Ooh, that's what I was thinking. Yes. Now, over the next quarter of a century, roughly, things in America are kind of just not getting better. And our best case scenario, we're staying the same. Mm -hmm. We are like in the midst of the Gilded Age at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So corruption was just part and parcel of how the government operated. And I think the name, you've talked about this before when we watched the show, Gilded Age is such a, an appropriate term for this time period where... It looked like there was a ton of wealth and progress and the American dream, stuff like that. But right. that was very few and far between. Most people were not living that life. You couldn't have said that better. Um, the disparity between kind of like this, like, like capital owning class mm. and just like your everyday American and average labor was just really wide. Yeah. Um, and it didn't lead to good things, right? like that divide there was progress right that's where the gilded part comes from in that like rail um way industrial expansion. progress yeah, yeah industrial yeah kind of going through like a second industrial revolution in a way scientific progress maybe exactly mm -hmm. and there was a sense of optimism especially amongst the elites but amongst just like your everyday people it was not great mm -hmm. i think that's the best way to put it honestly presidents at this time were really weak oh um, yeah they were very weak i can't even think of them <laughs> yes exactly you have like rutherford b hayes you do have garfield as well who's assassinated um but a lot of the time they would go into office and not just the presidents but like all across the federal government people would get elected and they'd basically bring their friends along and put mm. them in positions of power they called it quote unquote patronage mm -hmm. borrowing from the old uh, latin word for like the roman system which that was not what patronage was yeah um but, you know, it's basically just, like, their way of justifying corruption. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah, pretty pretty big bummer, honestly. Especially when the country's struggling so much, you'd want strong leadership. You'd think so, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and we'll get to that, actually. Mm. So, remember that economic disparity I was talking about? Yeah. So, lots of the rural poor would often migrate away from farms mm -hmm. and just the rural communities into cities to try to find work during this like 25 year period. That makes sense. And also farmers in general were just having a really rough time of it. Even the ones that did want to stick it out. So what happened was prices were going further down at this point in time. Um, and this would drive farmers to go into debt. Mm. So the following crop cycle, they would try to increase their yields, yeah. right? so that they could sell more. But the problem with this was that it was just driving prices down even more. Oh, And so no. you were in this vicious cycle where like you would increase yields, but that would contribute to the, you know, the excess crop production because everyone's trying to do that. And the price is just basically are racing to zero. Oh gosh. And this would, you know, the cycle would just continue and continue and farmers would get more and more desperate. Um, the uneasiness felt by farmers was also shared in, just in general by lots of the public. Um, 
the biggest increase in wealth at this time was coming from railroads specifically and mm-hmm. just industry in general to an extent, as well as like the financial firms that are um, supporting them. Mm. Right. So like Wall Street issuing bonds or like stock certificates on behalf of those companies, kind of like the the early versions of what you think of as like the stock market and other capital markets. That's so interesting. I was a finance major in college, guys. I know a lot about this. <laughs> I don't. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then this is kind of a powder keg waiting to happen um, because as railroads became more and more popular, speculation also increased on the value of these railroad companies. What does speculation mean? Basically the, what you think, how much something is valued at. Okay. And so when you speculate, it's just, it's kind of like, you usually use the term speculate when you're talking about a bubble, oh. like a financial bubble. And that's what was happening here. Like people are just kind of like, it's the hot new thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and you, then, you know, you just get the great depression of 1893 because this, this vicious cycle of like, oh, it's invest in railroad companies. Like, and even though they're not going to make the returns that you should be getting from the capital that you're, you're giving them. Uh Oh, uh, so like it, you know, people are either the investors are either a going to get pissed and want their money back or yeah. B, the company is just not going to be able to meet its financial obligations and fold yeah. or both. Uh huh. And it's kind of what happened. So the causes of this depression and total are kind of complex, but this rapid proliferation of railroad lines created a false impression of the growth of like the economy as a whole. So people were just seeing this one little facet and being like, oh, wow, the American economy is doing great. It wasn't. Um, It's just railroads were doing really well Mm -hmm. until they weren't. Until they weren't, yeah. And then it's like, wow, boom. Again, one industry or sector does not define the economy as a whole. And that still, you know, is present today. It's very dangerous when that happens. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, it was the railroad industry was just in a bubble. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like how I feel, like, to be honest, artificial intelligence is being treated right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, AI industries, or how the cryptocurrency market was about, like, oh, two my years gosh. ago. Yes. Like, three years ago. I was about to ask, Not that's a great connection that you made with crypto, but I kind of picked up on the sentiment that, like, people were probably investing in railroads because everyone's like, you got to invest in this. This is the new exactly. hot thing. Exactly. This is how people are getting rich. That's 100% correct. And that's definitely what was going on with crypto. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And you think that's what's happening with AI? Yeah. I mean, there are, like, here's the thing. Even with cryptocurrency and with railroads, right, there's legitimate use cases for these things. And yeah. they are important. And they are, like, you know, in ca- these cases, revolutionary. But there's you get to the point where they're so overhyped that you're, the value goes down. Yeah, the v- actual underlying value is lower than what like the public thinks it is. That's a really good way of explaining it. Yeah, and that's basically what a bubble is mm-hmm. in just like pure layman's terms. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's not great. The first, <laughs> going back to 1893, this isn't a good time. This is actually a pretty crappy time. So the first railroad company to fold was the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company, And they kind of started a domino effect where just a bunch started just like kind of falling or failing right after. That's not fun. No, no, it's not good. Basically, it created a panic, which means that investors were like, oh, no, Uh I need my money back. Yeah. And they're just like they're doing runs on the bonds that they have. Right. So like the way that these companies operated is like they issue debt. Mm -hmm. So like you like can go and buy oh railroad company a i'm gonna buy like a stock or i'm gonna buy like a debt from this company right Mm -hmm. with the expectation that they'll not only pay the debt back but then give you interest payments on top of that Mm -hmm. and so all these people that were holding on to those bonds were like oh no i just gotta cash this in i don't even care i just need i just need my money back and the more people do that yes the worse the situation is because the, the whole point of it in the first place is to get cash in the door for the business to you know operate Exactly. Uh oh. And now they don't have the money and then they close. So basically, as with many financial woes, this whole economic depression was caused by psychological factors from beginning mm-hmm. to end rather than, you know, any sort of sound like financial fundamental analysis. Mm hmm. I mean, That's a really good way of putting it. This is like, weirdos, we're getting like a master class. Getting a little MBA lesson. <laughs> a little... Even though I don't have an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> But you can give the lessons. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, hopefully one day I can give an MBA class about podcasting. That would be, oh my even gosh. though I've never, and I have no intention of getting MBA. And MBA students may not need a class on podcasting. That's also true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe running a podcast. Exactly. The business side. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. I don't think the artistic side would be too much of interest to them. <laughs> so- I feel like if you were to do that though, and I think the weirdos would agree somehow you're going to end up lecturing them on ancient Rome. The late Roman Republic, to be specific. I plead the fifth. (laughs) (laughs) So from 1893 to 1894, the unemployment amongst the working class went from like 3% to 19% across the whole country. Oh my gosh. And it gets worse, like in certain areas. So like New York York State, guess how much, guess how I reached. Um... 25 35 oh my michigan gosh. got to 43 percent. holy smokes michigan it was almost one in two people was unemployed oh my gosh yeah it's insane i mean at this time it was not uncommon to go into any major city and see just lots of homeless folks in those cities I mean, unfortunately, in today's it, today's time, it's very common to see that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't up until, you know, before this time, it wasn't No, that no, common. that would have been rare. That would have been really rare. Mm-hmm. So it was also around this time that 20-year-old Leon Cholgosh was out of work, and he was facing pretty huge discontentment with the socioeconomic conditions of America. But we'll get to that later on in the story. Okay. We finally get to the election of 1896. Oh, 1896. 1896. Yeah, Mm -hmm. this is, I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but this is a pretty like watershed moment, I think, for American politics. Mm -hmm. And this does sort of end like from the time of like Lincoln's assassination to 1896 is kind of viewed as like one sort of like era in American like history. And this starts the next era. Okay. Um, that goes all the way into the 30s. So this is a wow. this is like a really big watershed moment. Yeah, that's important. Um, I think they call it like the fourth alignment or something like that. If you if you're really big into American history, which uh, neither of us neither really of are. us are. Like we know the basics, but not like we're not deep into it. The fourth alignment sounds like it would be a yoga studio or a juice bar or something. Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> This is why I'm your co-host. I bring perspective. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> that's fair. You do bring the good perspective here. So, I mean, things were so crazy. There actually emerged like a third party Ooh. that was pretty big. They were called the Populist Party. And it was looking like they could even win the election mm-hmm. at this point. Good for them. So, Unless um, they were evil. No, they were, they were pretty good. <laughs> I think... And this was a really interesting race because William McKinley obviously won, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like you guys... Just, Probably saw that coming. Spoiler. I really hope you guys did. Um, I mean, I guess not necessarily. Well, you should have known. Uh, <laughs> not to be judgmental or anything. But basically what happens is it comes down to William Jennings Bryan. Okay. Who is the who is the nominee for the Populist Party. And he's also the double nominee uh, for the Democratic Party. Oh. So he's the nominee for both. Oh, combined. my. He's And he loses? Get this, he gets more votes than any other presidential candidate in American history up until that point, winner or loser, except for McKinley. Oh my god! So McKinley's number one of all time, William Jennings Bryan's number two. If he ran in any other race, he would have won. What an interesting race. Yeah, so, I mean, because both had really good points mm-hmm. of... Or really good, like, intentions. They both wanted the same thing. They just had very different ways about going about it. Mm-hmm. William Jennings William Jennings Bryan was willing to compromise um, monetary, uh, like the monetary system a little bit more. Like he was willing to add in like a silver um, Mm. value for dollars as opposed to the the gold gold value. Mm -hmm. Yes. And McKinley's like, nope, like I want sound money. We're staying on the gold standard. And uh, that, that ended up winning. Okay. And that was, and in hindsight, that was the right choice. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, it certainly helped that like the following year, like a bunch of gold was discovered in Alaska. So mm, yes, yeah, that definitely mm-hmm. helped a lot. But I mean, again, like William McKinley, he was the governor of Ohio. He ran on it like a, just a campaign of like sound economic policy. He was going to even introduce like protectionist tariffs. Mm. Um, 
Which, Interesting. Yeah, that part I don't I can't fully explain to you guys. I just I mean tariffs are basically when you uh, put a tax on foreign goods that are mm-hmm. being imported into your country, right? Mm-hmm. So he taxed that. Um, trying to boost, probably with the farming thing you were talking about, trying to boost yes. uh, local economy. Like, yeah, exactly. The local, like the domestic Domestic, businesses. that's the word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, this again, like I said, the turnout was really big for this election. Um, the biggest that it ever, by far. And McKinley you know, got like... 7 million votes or something like that. Wow. A little over 7 million votes. That's wild. That's right. a lot. Especially because today, even even though our voter turnout is terrible in American elections, even presidential elections like to this day, I mean, the winner gets like what, like 70, 80 million votes, something like that. It's mm-hmm. so like 10 times the amount. Mm-hmm. Kind of crazy. This is a friendly reminder to the History for Weirdos listeners. Register to vote. Yeah, register to vote. Like, it's understand important. what, like, what or who you're voting for. Like, just do that stuff. Yeah. Do like do your research. Like, really. Mm-hmm. That's all I uh, all I have to say about that. <laughs> so, I fi- I've given a ton of backstory. Right. This yeah. is this is crazy amount of backstory. I feel like, but we're finally getting towards like the major event and the reason for this episode. So, all that you really need to know about McKinley's presidency up until 1901 is is the following. Like, the economy rebounded after McKinley's administration introduced that tariff in 1897. Yeah. Gold was found in Alaska, like I said, which, again, was very coincidental and also helped the gold standard. Mm-hmm. And there was a short war fought against Spain, the Spanish-American War, mm-hmm. where um, which resulted in, like, the early, the kind of early portions of American imperialism. <laughs> So exciting times, <laughs> exciting times, right? <laughs> Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines were ceded to the United States. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, the U S also annexed Hawaii during this time and it oh became a territory. Um, so with all of this, these things happening, I know we, we think of imperialism as bad today, but at the time, at the time it was seen as great, like a great right. sign, like, Oh my gosh, your country's doing well. Exactly. Yeah. And so he won, he, he, he actually ran against the same guy, funny enough, oh, William Jennings Bryan, and he beat him by even a larger margin. Yeah, I could see why people would be happy with those results of his presidency so far. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You couldn't have said it better. Um, but now that we've kind of covered that, let's get to the 1901 Pan-American Exposition. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. So this was taking place in Buffalo, New York. Where my dad was. Where your dad was. <laughs> in 1901. And although this technically was not like an official World's Fair, um, it did attract roughly 8 million people between May 1st and November 2nd of 1901. That's a lot of people in Buffalo. Yeah. So it was a big event. It was huge. And you said May, right? Uh, yes. May through uh, November. Okay. That makes sense. Because winter in Buffalo, you wouldn't want to be there. No. No. Especially, actually, funny enough, when the assassination took place, it was very hot. Yeah. You had that summer heat coming through. So, um, it's interesting, too, because its theme, as you may have guessed, maybe, is (laughs) (laughs) Pan-Americanism. Yeah, or, you know, the creation of kind of like a broader American identity. And when I say American, I mean like all the Americas. The Americas, yeah. Yeah. We're all American. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's I know it's kind of weird because it's like when you say American, you could refer to like, oh, a citizen of the United States, or you could literally mean like anyone in North or South America. In English, we don't have a term for United states in, right? Or United States citizen. Yeah. No, we don't. There's one in Spanish. Estadounidense. Estadounidense. There we go. That's to, because again, we're all American, so it's to specify where. But we're American. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe you just have to say it in that accent. <laughs> yeah. And so this kind of Pan-Americanism, I think it's 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 not really important to the story, but I just think it's kind of interesting because, yeah. um, you know, this was supposed to be like a marriage of like all the Americas, kind of like how Europe has like their own identity. Yeah. We wanted something, I think, similar. That's, that's just the way I kind of viewed it. Yeah. And, you know, while well-meaning, I think, I, it was, I think that was generally a failure. I would say so. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, random aside. But back to the event itself, um, it was a really big deal, right? Eight million people. Mm-hmm. And it was quite large geographically, too. It was kind of like a city within a city. Um, it was over half a square mile. So, you know, kind of, kind of big. 
And it was so beautiful because of all the lights. It was called the Rainbow City during its run um, because it was lit like day and night, which again, like today, that's not a big deal. But back then, 1901, that's a huge that's a deal. Huge deal, especially yeah. with lots and lots of light. Yeah. Kind of like Vegas, you know? That would have been very exciting and felt like, oh, this is the future. Like avant, yes, exactly. The futuristic mm-hmm. avant garde, however mm-hmm. you want to describe it. Um, um, I mean, in fact, all the electricity needed. Mm hmm came from niagara falls which was 25 miles away oh my gosh yeah so they just they got that free electricity basically the water power Mm -hmm. yeah exactly and the convention also served as a place to showcase like art from all over the americas right oh that would be beautiful to see yeah and was kind of like the the this is what american art is at the turn of the century Mm -hmm. oh my gosh i want to find pictures of this event oh we will there's pictures of this event um and yeah we'll definitely post them okay cool because this sounds that event alone sounds fascinating it is it's incredible yeah like it, it was really cool i mean there was also uh I think I mentioned this earlier, but or later. I'm not sure though, so I want to say it now while it's top of mind. They had like an early version of an X-ray. Machine. Oh no, you hadn't mentioned this yet. Yeah, no, no, I I might have in my notes later, but I'm just not sure if I just read it and didn't put it down. But anyways, yeah. So X-ray machine, early one. They have it by invented by none other than Thomas Edison. That's so cool. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, that would be that would be a fun spot to time travel to. Whenever we get to time travel. Oh my god! Imagine. Okay. No, I shouldn't say it. <laughs> I'll mess up the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Oh yeah. It was Act natural. It was like literally the next thing I had. <laughs> um, also this place was really cool because they, they, um, they had a roller coaster there and, mm. and then they were going to have another one that apparently had a flip. Shut up. 1901 guys. This is not, this is 1901, right? So if you're, you're thinking of going to magic mountain or wherever, no. like this is over a hundred years ago. Imagine everyone in like their formal dresses and suits and their top hats and their corsets in a loop-de-loop freaking Oh my god. Ride. That's crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And they thought so too, so that's why it wasn't unveiled. Like yeah, they're no like, one could this, write it. Uh, this is too wild. Yeah, this is too uh, so weird here. <laughs> so um interesting too, uh there was like just clearly a sense of optimism that permeated throughout the crowd I bet. Uh, especially since the president of the united states would be in attendance um in fact actually even starting off this parade one of the the few people who oversaw the opening parade was none other than vice president teddy roosevelt i love teddy roosevelt teddy <laughs> so guys we're coming to it September 4th, 1901, <laughs> William McKinley arrived at the fair and was greeted by thousands of people at the time um, because he was a, you know, again, like a fairly popular president. And I think it used to be cool to see the president. Now we're all just like uh, so annoyed. So annoyed because of the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it used to probably be like an exciting thing, right? For the president to come around. Yeah. And he was... I'll get into it more, but he was definitely like a man of the people kind of mm. guy, like very like salt of the earth. Like you, he could, he could shoot the shit with anyone. Makes sense with, um, Teddy Roosevelt as his VP. We'll also get into that. Mm. Really interesting. I'm not going to spoil it though. So the very next day. So on September 5th, 1901, he, William McKinley gave what would be his very last speech. Oh, Wow. There will be a picture of this event. They, there's actually like a photograph of this giving his speech. Um, and that will also be on our Instagram. So shameless plug, follow us if you haven't already. Mm-hmm. At History for Weirdos. At History for Weirdos. Exactly. Just like that, in that voice. And we also have been posting, if you haven't seen already, shorts, uh, little short videos of our episodes. Right. Oh, yes. Very nice. <laughs> oh, very nice. So... Now, in general, though, about this William McKinley's um, visit to the, like this World Fair, the Secret Service was really worried about this trip um, because they feared like this would be the place for an assassination. And they were right. They were right. They just didn't, they didn't stop him, but they were right about that. <laughs> they were. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, something strange about this, too, um, and this kind of feeds into something I will cover at, at the end of this episode, but... Um, there was a rule like at this time that if you're approaching the president of the United States, right, you could, you had to have your hands visible and open. 
like okay so kind of just like, like hey, you're unarmed yeah it, 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 it's not like you, you don't have to like put your hands up like you're under arrest or whatever um or you're surrendering but like you just have to have your hands up be like hey man what's up you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. jazz hands jazz hands exactly that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> be like hey, hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this was obviously like to protect the president yes um and it was a good rule but for whatever reason this rule was suspended during this fair what yeah and if they were worried in hindsight not the best idea no so Again, McKinley was a man of the people, so he really liked going out and like interacting with just everyday folks. You know, mm. presidents don't do that today for like security reasons, but like back in the day, that wasn't uncommon. Yeah. Um, it was becoming less and less common by this time, but it wasn't uncommon. So um, his secretary of state, John Hay, remarked that he had never seen him in higher hope or confidence like on the 5th. Oh, that's so sad. So the sixth rolls around and Leon Cholgosh ha had been renting a room above a saloon in Buffalo. Also mm. kind of as an aside, and it is, and this is just me ranting for like 30 seconds. <laughs> he only paid $2 a week for that room mm -hmm. adjusted for inflation today. That's like 70 ish, $75 maybe. And a I'm like, dude, a week, a week, not a day, not a day, a week. And so, I mean, if you go to a Motel 6, that's like $75 a night. Yeah, maybe. It could yeah, be more. It could be more. And that just like pisses me off. I know. Anyways, We're... I'm sure it pisses all of you guys off too. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Rant is <laughs> over. So <laughs> uh, since the time that Leon had been laid off from work eight years prior, he had become more like radicalized as kind of like a socialist anarchist hmm. is the best way to put it how interesting yes the juxtaposition of those words right it was a different time like this was pre-soviet union yeah. so there isn't like a state that is run by any sort of like socialist or communist like ideals it's just an idea kind of at this point yeah that's so interesting yeah clearly it sounds I think better on paper because it's like you need to have some sort of... They kind of contradict each other a little, he, don't they? I, I, I'm i sure there are people... Who that would disagree. That would disagree, yeah. yes. But I mean, I think in theory they don't, but in practice they do. Okay. I mean, and that's the thing. Like theory, and people will hate me for this, theory is completely meaningless if it doesn't work in practice. Yeah. Like, sorry, it's true though. But it also tells us the mindset that Leon's in. Exactly. He's and feeling very disenfranchised. Exactly. And I even put in here, like, to be fair, like he had seen labor strikes erupt into violence um, and he became ill, which I believed like led to his predisposition of being interested in like a radical philosophy mm -hmm. um, and further emboldened by, you know, like thought leaders at the time, like Emma Goldman, with whom he met and obtained more literature. Mm. It's interesting. We'll get into a little bit about her later on in the story. Um, interestingly though, I, I thought like everyone mentioned that he was really socially awkward mm. and, uh, just really asked really blunt questions. Mm. Um, like I, to the point where some of the like socialist circles thought he was a cop. <laughs> Cause he that's how not. awkward he was to be around. But that's how like just socially awkward and just kind of like, like, where can I find this person? Mm -hmm. Like just no social cues whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Possible neurodivergence going on. That's exactly what I thought. Mm -hmm. Like possibly on the spectrum or something like that. Maybe. So yeah, they even again, like they even issued a warning about him to like other like little socialist circles. <laughs> like, Hey, this guy is a cop. Be careful. <laughs> he was not a cop. So he was mostly inspired though by a name or by a man by the name of Gaetano Bresci. And he was an anarchist who actually assassinated King Umberto the first of Italy in 1900. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, as a way to give power back to the common man, you know, in his eyes. Which I'm sure that didn't happen. No, it did no. not happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they went to fascism. Yeah. Like, like 20 years later. <laughs> so now back to the narrative though. He, uh, Leon noticed earlier that day, like on the 6th, that McKinley would sometimes just straight up like walk away from his security detail. Kind of like what the Pope used to do. Oh, yeah, the current Pope? Yeah, where he kind Pope? of like escape. And so he could like hang out with the people. That's what 
McKinley would too. The current Pope, yeah, he'll like uh, in the middle of the night sneak out type of thing so he can go volunteer and stuff like that, apparently. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, he doesn't volunteer, but he just wants to meet people and like yeah. talk with like, you know, the everyday citizen. Yeah, I think McKinley was an extreme extrovert. Mm-hmm. I can relate a little bit. Really? We're shocked. Shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so he also, Leon, also knew that the president would be meeting with members of the public later that afternoon in the Temple of Music, which is also a credible name. Oh my gosh, we should have temples of music. Yeah. And it's funny, I'm wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt right now, <laughs> so I feel like that's very apt. Yes. I wonder if I condition myself to wear this shirt. <gasps> Maybe, Maybe. You, you brainwashed yourself. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. um, so Leon also had like a little like small revolver that he would be carrying in his pocket to do the deed. Hmm. Terrible, and, uh, terrible. So McKinley arrives at the temple music building and at approximately like 4 PM, he starts to meet with people who were lined up to greet him. Mm-hmm. And at, Right around 4.07 p.m. is when Leon gets to the front of the line and is greeted by McKinley. So the summer heat was really intense this day. And I'm and I'm guessing added to the irritability that like pe- people feel with this weather. And that must have like influenced Leon in a little bit to be a little bit more aggressive. Mm-hmm. Because um, when McKinley like uh, extended his hand, Leon smacked it away. Okay, I can't imagine, obviously, I'm not like trying to empathize or condone this by any means, but he's trying to assassinate the president, like the adre- like the adrenaline and the hormones pumping through him, oh yeah, and the sun beating down, and he's nervous, like that makes sense actually exactly right um I'm, yeah, like I think I love the way you said that too, because you're not excusing what he's doing. We're just trying to like understand his mindset, I yeah, think. yeah, and I think that does add to it, like I think it would be like irresponsible for us to just like completely disregard that, yeah, not that I could ever imagine like doing them, that like killing someone who isn't like harming you, but mm-hmm. like especially the President of the United States, like are you kidding me, yeah. Oh you gotta be God. out of your. You gotta out be out of your, your mind. Yeah. I mean, I, he probably was honestly. Mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be hard not to be. But anyways, Leon Cholgosh smacks William McKinley's hand out of the way, pulls out his like thirty-two caliber Iver Johnson revolver. It was covered by a white handkerchief, mm. so like you couldn't see the gun. Like you couldn't see exactly what it was. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and he fired two shots. Ooh. The first one, like, I think bounced off a button and got caught in his jacket, but like just grazed him, didn't hurt him, um, you know, beyond like a, a scratch. But the second one lodged right in his gut. Oh no. So it's going to be slow. Yes. Um, the shot knocked, like, like it hit McKinley. He kind of like staggered a little bit. Um, and apparently had this like really perplexed look on his face, like, what the hell just happened? Mm. Which I kind of get, I guess, especially because he's just like, Hey man, I'm just here to like meet people. And like, I want to like listen to what you guys have to say. He wasn't expecting it at all. No, he was not expecting this. I mean, again, he was a fairly popular president. Mm-hmm. Um, so eyewitnesses to the event mentioned that there was like a brief moment, like right after the shots happened where everything just kind of got still like quiet and still. Mm. And I think I just imagine that it took everyone like a second or two to, to fully process like what is happening here. Um, what the hell is going on? Honestly, it's probably what they're all thinking. And violence like this at that time in a crowd, very uh, unheard of. Exactly. Yeah. Very innocent time in some ways. Yes, exactly. And I hear that now. Everyone's just sprinting. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And also remember, like, gunshots in real life are much louder than they make them on TV if you haven't ever heard one. Um, so that that's also, like, very strange that everyone's just like, there's two of them that go off. Two loud noises all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And then after that just brief moment, like, panic started to ensue. Um, the guy behind Leon was a man by the name of James Benjamin Parker, and he actually is the one to tackle Leon to the ground. Wow. Um, before he could get a third shot off. That's like, brave. He's going to shoot again, and he just tackles him. 
And a second later, uh, buff, uh, buff, excuse me, Buffalo Detective John Geary, an artilleryman, which is a soldier, Francis O'Brien, jumped on top of Leon and just started to beat him to hell. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they, so you have like three dudes and then other like uh, policemen and soldiers start just jumping on this guy. And it's just like a dog pile. <laughs> dog pile on this they're one dude. Be- they're, they have like rifle butts. They're beating the hell out of this guy. Here's the crazy thing, though. McKinley's still reeling from all of this, right? He's like, he he's kind of like barely holding himself up, and he orders his men to actually stop beating Leon, um, mm. before he's dragged away. Uh, which I guess to me, honestly, really showcases his magnanimous behavior. Yeah. Because if honestly, if that were me, I'd be really pissed. Like I would be like in the moment. I think for a second, I'd be really fearful. But then I think I'd just be pissed. Like. Who the hell do you think you are trying to kill me? Mm -hmm. He must have been a very open person. And he probably wanted to hear, like, why? Yes. You know, like, no, like, don't hurt him. You know, I want to know what's going on, kind of. Yeah. Or he just had a lot of protective instincts himself. Right. That's a really good point. I Mm -hmm. like that. (laughs) You know what's also crazy about this whole thing? Mm -hmm. McKinley at this time didn't even want to leave. What? What do you mean? He wanted to continue speaking with folks who were there. And he was just like, don't worry about it. It's just a scratch. I'll walk it off. Sir, I think you have a bullet in your belly. (laughs) Yeah, that was not going to happen. He was really injured. Um, The second part, the second thing he said though, like afterwards, after, I guess the first thing he said after like, uh, they were like, no, you're going to go to the hospital. You're going to get some medical attention. He asked about his wife. If she was okay. If she was okay. Oh, that's so sweet. Yes. So he's put on a stretcher. He's taken outside and there's a huge crowd outside because they're like, what the hell's going on? And they all see like the president of the United States being carried on a stretcher to an ambulance. How shocking. Yes. And he had like an ashen face. Yeah. It was not good. It was not pretty. It'd be very terrifying to watch. I think it was, it was not good. Um, Interestingly, like on the ride to the hospital, mm-hmm. he removes uh, like a piece of metal, which we think was the bullet mm-hmm. uh, from his inside his jacket. And he looks at it and he says, huh, I believe that is a bullet. Oh, he's so calm. Like so casual. Like this present had jokes for days. Oh my God. If someone shot me twice and one bullet was like in my gut, I'd be like crying. Yeah, I think that's a normal reaction. I, I think mean, I would cry. <laughs> this guy's just like, eh, whatever. And this, he was like, he's seen some stuff. Then he he was a Civil War veteran. So okay, he saw some shit. Yeah, so he saw some stuff for sure. Exactly. So within minutes of the shots, uh, the news was conveyed around the world actually by telegraph. I'm sure. Yes, and especially within yeah within minutes, like every, like most major cities, like someone was aware that. Yeah, this happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, this was crazy too, because this was a world before radio even, let That's alone television. Right. That's right. And so uh, people like oh, in, were, were gathering around news stations, like thousands mm-hmm. of people would gather around news stations, like waiting for the next wire to come through to tell them like what's happening. Can you imagine now we have it endless, endless information in our hands at all times. Exactly. To have to like go somewhere else to wait and listen. That's wild. Yeah. But to them probably felt very advanced actually. No, it definitely would have felt advanced um, because just think about it. Like before you had like the pony express and yes, which actually just didn't last that long, but like you had to like wait by, you know, locomotive or you had to wait by just horse. regular mail. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly. Before you get information. Now you could get it within minutes. Like if it's big news like this, yes, which was huge. So McKinley was shot in the stomach. Like, like I said, um, which up until about 17 years prior was a death sentence that would result in a long, painful and slow death. Yeah. It's Um, a slow way to go. It was a bad way to go. You usually get some sort of infection and Mm -hmm. or gangrene and die from that. And it's not pretty, Mm -hmm. but a Swiss doctor had invented like some way to address this. Mm -hmm. And don't ask me any more about that because I couldn't even tell you if I wanted to. I won't. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But the surgeon that had been treating McKinley wasn't able to remove the bullet. He couldn't find it. So it's terrible. He 
<laughs> left the bullet inside and he sewed him up with the bullet <gasps> inside of him. And yeah, because you can't keep him open either. Right. Yeah, and so he would later write dangerous. that like a like quote, a bullet once it ceases to move does little harm. Oh no, but sir, that's wrong. Yeah. I was going to say, I would love to hear what our <laughs> medical professional <laughs> listeners like have to say about that. Yeah. Do so you leaving lead in your body inside? It does no harm. That's fine. Right? Yeah. We've all had a little bullet yeah, in our know, tummies. Just <laughs> rub some dirt on it. <laughs> rub some dirt on it is basically what that doctor said. <laughs> kind of. That's wild. So regardless of the efficacy of that, <laughs> Whatever that is, actually. Um, the next morning, McKinley was awake and even in good spirits, interestingly enough. Oh, no. So he was relaxed. He was conversational. Pobre. And he looked like he was going to make a full recovery. Pobrecito. He asked his secretary, you know, how even like the attendees liked his speech. He's like, well, did I do a good job? Though? Yeah. He's like, did I do a good job? Yeah. And he's like, yes, yeah, sir. You did do a good job. That would be you. I know that would be me. But, but like, like, did the speech go well? Did the speech go well? Did people like it? Yeah. Sir, you you were shot. <laughs> you actually still have a bullet inside of you. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so Vice President Teddy Roosevelt, um, he had been in Vermont, and he booked it to Buffalo when this happened. Oh. Um, to visit McKinley. And he did leave a couple of days later, as did lots of people who visited him, um, because they, I think, wanted to give him time to rest. Yeah. Because everyone, everyone thought he was going to be fine. Everyone thought he was going to make a full recovery. So remember that guy, the first guy that tackled him? Yes. So he... That tackled Leon? That tackled Leon. Mm -hmm. He was black. Mm -hmm. And so there was even like news stories um, going around saying like, like, you know, a, you know, part of my French, but like, like a quote unquote Negro mm -hmm. was the one that helped that save the white president, you know? Yeah. And it was... Oh yeah. And you were talking about, the, you set the stage for race relations at this time. Exactly. Really yeah. Really good. Yeah. So... Uh, the fact that that happened actually helped ease race relations like temporarily, but it helped ease some tension. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's like a, a complex issue, but, um, it did help a little bit. Um, but un you know, unfortunately though, we know where this is going. I will say it is important to note that it being a black man in a very racialized country, how amazing that he didn't stop for a second but to think I'm going to protect my president. Yeah, exactly. That speaks a lot to that man. Yeah. Oh, his he character. Was. His story is tragic. I, I, I <gasps> almost didn't even want it. I didn't write it down because I, I looked into it and I was going to share like what happened with him. And it, it's not good. Uh Oh, he kind of dies in obscurity, like only years later. And he was a young man. Oh so, no. Yeah. It really, it actually really upsets me because he was like literally a national hero. A hero. And he is treated like garbage. Oh no. So at first he's treated well, but then eventually and then it garbage. gets bad. Mm. And so it's just it's lots of tragedy then lots of tragedy. So going back to McKinley, um, after like everyone had left, mm -hmm. apparently he felt a little isolated and he missed everyone hanging out around with him. Oh my God. Are you the reincarnation of president McKinley? I know. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was the reincarnation of like Antoninus Pius. He's a Roman emperor. Because we went to... Oh, yeah, and you look like him. Yeah, I look just like him. It yeah. was really weird. No, but that's you. Weirdos, we'll spend like a week... Like one time we went uh, to a cabin with our friends. Shout out to the homies. And... The homies. We were there all weekend. There were dogs. There's friends. There's games. All the good stuff. And like when we got home later that week, Andrew's like, man, we never do anything. We never see our friends. And I was like, we just saw them all like yeah, two days was, ago. That was just a few days ago. Yeah. So you're very, very extroverted is what I'm trying to share. Maybe I am McKinley. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, hmm, no, I'm lonely. I just have, it's just me and my bullet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so also, this is kind of funny. Like one of the reasons why um, Teddy Roosevelt left was mm -hmm. to give him, probably to give him time to recover, but he was also just insanely pissed that Cholgosh uh, could possibly get only a few years in jail for attempted murder oh. um, as that was like New York state law. Oh. And so he was so enraged that he actually went to the mountains to go on like a vacation. <laughs> that's, that's how that's pissed kind he of was. Sweet. I know that's he, uh, that was a very Teddy response. I feel like, yeah. Um, but sadly though, this, we, you know, this recovery is a false one. Mm. 
the gangrene eventually did take hold and he would die at 2.15 a.m. on Saturday, September 14th, 1901. That's so sad. The cause of death is believed to be pancreatic necrosis, which is a condition really difficult to treat today and would have been impossible for those doctors at the time. Wow. So there was no hope for him. There was no hope. Mm -hmm. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was on his way back to Buffalo uh, when he heard, when he got the news. And so he heard, he got the news that morning. He was on his way to Buffalo. He arrived in Buffalo in the afternoon and he would take the oath of office to become the next president of the United States. Oh my gosh. So you're coming back from the mountains from your little Teddy Roosevelt vacation and you find out that one of your closest friends, your colleagues slash the president of the United States died and now you're president. It is interesting you mentioned friend. He was his president. They were colleagues. They were not friends? They were not friends. Well, he made it seem like they were. He was so upset by this Let's, incident. I'll get into that in a second. Um, oh. But finishing up this little section here. Cheese man. Cheese, I got some cheese man. So, <laughs> Joel Gosh, he went on trial for murder mm-hmm. of McKinley in the state court in Buffalo on September 23rd, 1901. Like just nine days after McKinley had died. Yeah. The trial was really short because he would be executed by electric chair on October 29th, 1901. So like scarcely five weeks later or something like that. Oh my. Yeah. (sighs) So that's, this is just such a tragic story. It is. I mean, he was radicalized. I don't think he was a bad person. I think he was ill mentally and physically possibly. Yeah. And he was exploited by people. Yeah. Not that it excuses anything, but my gosh, you kind of he was i can only imagine that he was just like a symptom of a larger problem that wasn't being addressed it's exactly it honestly from my point of view so fairly early on in this um there's actually some conspiracy theories about like what was happening Ooh, conspiracy theories so the first one was that this was actually like part of a larger anarchist syndicate to assassinate president mckinley Oh, right. That this guy, Leon, was just the tip of the spear, so to speak. It sounds a little far fetched because it was. Okay. Um, A bunch of anarchists across the United States were arrested within days of this happening, right? Is there like an anarchist registry or something? I don't know how that works. (laughs) How did they know? Okay. I think there were, you know, there were some more prominent people and then they were like, you know, in the big cities that the local police probably targeted. Okay. So. There was that. Um, the, it's interesting too because when they were interrogated by police, a lot of them admitted, like, "Oh yeah, like I knew this guy. I met him." Mm-hmm. But they were like, they also said, "I had absolutely nothing to do with what he did." Mm-hmm. In fact, like that Emma Goldman that I re- uh, referenced earlier, yes, she was also known as the quote high priestess of anarchy. End quote. Damn, that's a good band name. I know. I was gonna say Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Priestess that's... of Anarchy or Priestesses of Anarchy? Priest high of anarchy? Priestess. Oh, High Priestess. I'm sorry. High Priestess of Anarchy is a dope band name. That's a really good one. Yeah. Weirdos. She... You heard it here first. <laughs> you got to go start that band, Weirdos. We've given you so many bands to start. Just start one. Yeah. one. I, I really want one of you guys to start a band, get really big, and then you can invite us to your concert. Yes. I'd that's our dream. So, I'd be so stoked. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, <laughs> oh my God, that's too good. <laughs> yeah, never, needless to say, everyone was released. All these anarchists were released because yeah. there was zero evidence pointing he, to this. It looks like he totally acted alone. Yes. Now, the second one mm-hmm. is that Teddy Roosevelt actually orchestrated this assassination. Oh, hell no. So, I don't think so. To be completely upfront, I think this particular conspiracy is also BS. Mm hmm. I do not think that, but I want to share it anyways, as this was viewed as a possibility at the time or okay. shortly thereafter. That's fair. Um, first of all, and I've been careful not to mention this, right? Even though I think you mentioned uh, the opposite just recently, but Roosevelt and McKinley did not like each other. They really did not like each other. That is so wild. It is. I, it is wild because I find them to be very similar to each other. They seem very similar. Yeah. I mean... To, they disagree. They would disagree, though. I'm sure they would disagree. Interesting. But I'm like, hey, I'm third party, man, and you guys sound pretty similar. Yeah. Um, 
they rarely agreed on anything. In fact, the one thing they agreed on is how much they hated each other, apparently. What? Which is, again, I'm like, how? Why? I don't get this. Um, you know, and of course, like, you know, with McKinley out of the way, Roosevelt has a lot to gain, right? Yeah. He's presidency. now the president. Mm-hmm. So there's certainly motive for that to happen. Yeah. Um, and also kind of like one of the, the factors of this was that like the, there were two Secret Service members uh, flanking McKinley wh- when the shot happened, right? They were right next to McKinley and they would say that, uh, or they would claim that they were distracted while Leon shot McKinley. Did they say what was distracting them? I didn't find like what any they said. concrete thing. Yeah, right, exactly. But it's given Praetorian guard, if you know what I mean. Oh, <gasps> like they intentionally had a blind eye to the situation. Kind of, yeah. That's the theory, at least. Yeah, that's the theory. It does give that kind of vibe. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and I mean, like, what are you distracted by? Granted, you know, I've never had a role where I have to protect someone like that, but that's actually your job. Yeah, is to just watch McKinley. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's nothing else for you to be doing. Yeah, there are consequences of this, um, like kind of broad sweeping consequences. Okay. So, I mean, it, it is, it's just kind of ironic that ultimately it came down to like this six foot six jacked dude that happened to just be standing behind Leon yeah. who could tackle him to the, to the ground before he got his third shot off. Right. Because his bodyguards are distracted. Yes. They don't even have iPhones. What are they? I don't understand. Yeah. I don't, I don't get that one to be that. It does sound kind of suspect. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I don't think Roosevelt though orchestrated all of this. That wouldn't be his style. He would have like challenged no. him to a duel or something. Yeah. Literally. Mm-hmm. He would have been like, you sir are an ass. <laughs> <laughs> slap, slap. <laughs> yes. We do um, at dawn. I mean, but I mean, and also here's to me the most damning evidence against this sort of, this conspiracy theory. Okay. And that is like two U S presidents before him had also had people just come right up to them and <laughs> shoot them. I mean, that is literally how Lincoln died. Right. Yeah. It was from behind granted, but still came right up to him, shot him. Yeah. And then James A. Garfield, the guy very similar to McKinley just walked right up to him. Boom. So the, this is the drill that the secret service should be practicing is what do you do if someone walks right up to the president? <laughs> To shoot them. You know, you should really tell, go back in time and tell them that. Yeah. This yeah. is what you guys need to really focus on. <laughs> focus. Don't get distracted by like the lights and the roller coasters. Just watch McKinley. <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly, I just think the protection was a little incompetent if I'm being honest. Yeah. It's very possible. So this, this outraged the public. I'm sure. Absolutely outraged. Um, I mean, even members in government were so pissed about mm. this, right? This is now the third U.S. president that had been assassinated in less than 40 years. That's not looking good. That's not good. In 1902, it was made official that the Secret Service, which was a part of the U.S. Treasury at the time, mm-hmm. would actually protect the president at all times. That was not like the law. It was just like, oh yeah, we protect the president sometimes? Question mark. It, there wasn't like clear... <laughs> You know, like, oh, we'll protect him sometimes. Maybe the army will protect him sometimes. That was oh. one of the, the um, like, other alternative possibilities mm-hmm. was that the army would actually protect the president I and could not see the that. Secret Service. Yeah, I could see how that would have been the case. Right, and since he is the executive officer. Um, but that wasn't to be. And it actually, fun fact, it wouldn't be until 2003 that the Secret Service would actually be under the Department of Homeland Security and not the Department of the Treasury. That's so weird. Because the other thing that the Secret Service was established for was actually counting uh, or tracking counterfeit money, in case you didn't know. Maybe that's what distracted them. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe they were looking at some bills and were like, is this real? Do you think this is real? <laughs> yeah, oh my God. No, no, Can no, you no. imagine? Hold it up to the light. <laughs> yeah, we have to look. Oh, we should have kept our eye on McKinley. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, um, also interestingly, the secret service was created by none other than Abraham Lincoln. Oh, get this. Like literally, I I don't remember. I don't know if it's days or even possibly hours before he was in turn assassinated. That's so sad. Yes. That's tragic too. It's very tragic. How ironic. Incredibly ironic. Wow. Um, But again, this didn't satisfy the public, actually. Um, Mm -hmm. And it took until 1908 when Roosevelt, he consolidated a 
special task force of init different initiatives mm -hmm. into kind of one direct branch um, underneath the Department of Justice. Okay. And this would eventually become the FBI. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I think it was sense. just called the Bureau of Investigation at the time. Mm -hmm. Like the FBI that we know wouldn't come about till later, but this is the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. It's small. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And this was in direct, um, like, I guess this was direct response to the fear that anarchists were like attempting to destroy the country. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. It was one deranged lunatic, but there's still that fear. Right, yes. That was happening. Yes. And fear definitely um, moves people, right? Yes. People are motivated by fear. There was no evidence of this, but um, my point of view is that a lot of workers just wanted better pay and working conditions. And there were some extremist groups, yeah. like small extremist groups that would prey on lots of these folks, right? To join their cause mm -hmm. and use them as like bargaining chips and so, and like so forth. Because when you're unemployed and you have a family and all of those things, you could ease and, you know, lots of lack of education at this time, like right. lack of information, access to information. You could so easily fall prey to some nut jobs that are trying to just use you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I part of me like doesn't blame them. It's like you, your situation sucks and you just want and you're to be desperate. better. And you're desperate. Yeah. It's terrible. So... Honestly, what scares me about today, kind of like moving forward to today, is that I see a similar pattern kind of developing in the United States. I was thinking Yay. that too. I was thinking the same. Yes, you, you have like an oligarchy upper class that has, you know, massive wealth, right? But uses the government to their advantage to ever increase that wealth, even at the expense of fellow Americans. We're in the Gilded Age part two. We are. I think we are in a kind of a secondary Gilded Age. But without the cool dresses. Yeah, without the cool dresses. Also, here's the thing. Like the the, the wealthy class back then, they like built like universities. They built mm -hmm. museums. They built infrastructure. Bridges. These, yeah, schools. Schools. To put their names on things. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm like, even if it is out of vanity, at least it was advancing like the country forward. These, these billionaires today, they suck. They're definitely not building schools or no. bridges or opera houses, that's for sure. Yeah, they're just killing themselves at the bottom of the ocean. Yes. <laughs> or trying to get to space. Yeah. All of those silly like silly, silly things. things. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's that's kind of how I feel about it. But um I mean, honestly, like this sort of like agreement that like you have between like risk takers and the people um that like that they'll share in the profits right so you have like risk takers that will get like extraordinary rewards if mm. their risk is successful right mm -hmm. and i feel like there's been like a sort of like understanding that you know if people help you with that you kind of like share in the profits right mm -hmm. you still get the massive majority of the reward but you can like kind of share a little bit right because you're able to because mm -hmm. you're able to um but and i don't want to get into it like too much i'm even like hesitant to even say that i feel like um because i just I think I do see parallels though with the accumulation of wealth at the very top of society that is correlated to like a decline in like middle and like upper, like, or I guess the lower middle class, mm -hmm. right? Over, especially over the past 30 years. And you saw that again at kind of the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's not only, it's important to not only recognize this, but also like put in real steps to just raise the standard of living for every citizen um so that society can advance as a whole i mean here here personally you know i think the the free market is the best way to do that but and we shouldn't let corporations get too powerful so huzzah yeah anyways that's my philosophy i feel like i could just go down this rabbit hole like crazy but this is a history podcast after at the end of the day yeah and it's a, like you're sharing how you how you think we can address that issue but i think what's also important is that the f fact that you just used history to inform how we see our today and yes. what could happen in our future is like the whole point of studying history. I literally could not agree with you more. Yeah. And I guess that's why we're married. That's why we're married. <laughs> but no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I just, I think that, you know, the government should not be protecting the upper class, right? It should be acting as like a 
a judge, right? It's between like the American public and special interests. Mm. And it should always be on the side of like the everyday citizen. Yeah. yeah. And it is not. That's like, kind of the point of governments. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's funny because like, I think it's funny enough. Like, I mean, if you were to say like, you know, hear me talking about like wealth concentration, stuff like that, you'd probably think I'm like on, you know, like a Marxist or something. And I'm not, I'm actually a free market guy, but I just think you just have to put in some guardrails. Mm. Right. Like let yeah. people be free put in some guardrails and that's, I feel the best political philosophy, but anyways, I, I totally get it. I'm sure we're going to get so many hate messages yeah. after this episode. You guys, you guys just completely <laughs> disagree with me. Or if you agree with me, honestly, like let us know in the comments on, especially if you're listening on Spotify. I'm yes. really curious about that. Yes. Do you see the parallels? How do you think they can be addressed? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, there's probably no one right way anyway. Absolutely. It's a combination of things. And these are the conversations we should be having. Right, exactly. And and to me, like, I'm not really interested in, like, the politics, especially, like, yeah. the nitty-gritty politics. I mean, I am in that, like, to make it be efficient, but not, like, in the way that we treat it today. It's just all, like, distraction from, like, what are the actual problems? Mm -hmm. Like, address those problems and then, <laughs> I don't know, not, like, the little nitty like arguing over semantics yeah yeah the i would also be interested to hear if um international weirdos are noticing kind of like a similar pattern if people outside of the u.s feel the same yeah exactly i'd be really curious to know that myself well anyways regardless of how you feel or if you agree with me or disagree with me you know that is the assassination of william mckinley and uh, to me, in my point of view, it is like the most important like mm. assassination in American history that you've not heard of. That's a great way of putting it. Or may or may not have heard of. Like I had heard of it, but to didn't be honest, know the details. Yeah, but I didn't know any of these details. I didn't under the only context that I understood from this is that it allowed uh, Roosevelt to be president. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it, and it's so much deeper than that. I'm so glad that you talked about this today. Right. Yeah. You took it a little, you went from murder to assassination, which is, it is similar, but different. It's literally a murder. <laughs> it is literally a murder that has like giant implications. Yeah. Implications. Yeah. I think I said that once on this podcast. Implications. <laughs> but thank you so much for telling us about this story. Again, I, even when you asked at the beginning of the episode, I had forgotten that McKinley was assassinated until... I was then like, oh, yeah, that's how Roosevelt became president, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Let alone James A. Garfield. Mm -hmm. Like, I completely forget he's even president, let alone that he was assassinated. Yeah, so these these are the things that are important to learn. And it was definitely, um, like, a wild ride. Really tragic story, but very interesting story. Right. And, again, I had... No one really talks about it, but it's like, wow, no, this set the course of, like, kind of a country and a lot of the world. Just, like, yes. this one little event. Yes, exactly. Well, last but certainly not least, my sources for this, we actually use the Library of Congress. History.com has an incredible kind of like expose on, oh. on this. Encyclopedia Britannica is also pretty good. There was um, a, a University of Virginia article that mm -hmm. was really good, as well as a Florida State College at Jacksonville article. How interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Um, also, I think... The University of Virginia one gave me backstory like on the Gilded Age and a lot of like oh, kind of those cool. underlying societal trends that were happening. Very cool. Really interesting stuff. And then of course, Wikipedia. Of course, Wikipedia. Well, babe, thank you again for sharing this episode with us, the story of President McKinley's assassination. Weirdos, thank you so much for listening to another episode of History for Weirdos. We're going to give you a little reminder if you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And like we said earlier, don't forget to follow us on Instagram. We're going to share like pictures from the episode and videos at History for Weirdos. You got it. And until next time, guys. Until next time, weirdos. Adios.